All right, let us start. I think it's sort of like an applied kind of panel discussion that we will be having, but it's a bit futuristic at the same time. I think the previous plenary session started with the right kind of question. The question was about fear. It was sort of like between fear and romantic af attraction. And I'd like to start our conversation about irrational kind of fears. You heard in the discussion, um, sort of like the prediction of Mr. Greff that he covered in the past before. And he keeps saying that in the 30s and 40s of this century, the real AI will reach the level of intellect of human beings. There's not much time left before the 2030s kick in. You can quote one of the scientists who was also taking the panel discussion, giving concrete examples. That currently, those that already exist, the models of AI, they're sort of turn around the reptiles, the dogs, and we're reaching the primates level. There's not much of a distance left between sort of like a breakthrough that is coming. A lot of debates that could be could be happening? Will it be like a sort of like in big leaps? Will it be an evolutionary leap of some kind? But in any case, no matter how you sort of project the future, the 2030s, 2040s are upon us. It was, you know, some of the uh, recently, some of the scientists were predicting that it will be by 2000. Uh, 21st century, but things are sort of coming up faster as we ex expected. So, 2030s, 2040s. Let's start with the first question. Let's discuss that. What? All, all, all of you are close to the topic. And uh, and the first question is to you, Alexander, as one of the top executives of Spare Bank. That is your area of expertise in the bank. So you're on the front line about this uh, topic. So uh, if we talk about the Russian language large models. So will that be a leap? Is it the change of the architecture in the model? So it's not just going into one model, but maybe a series of models. And this kind of uh, change in the architecture, does it give any kind of sort of, does it help the leap or does it slow things down? And as you see in practice, what do you think how it will develop until the year 2040? The reason why I'm smiling, you know, I think back in 2016, when we were working back with uh, Vladimir Valevich, uh, I asked him, you know, could I be, could I be doing um, something on AI? We, both of us were working on risk management and he gave me his permission. So all the d dynamics uh, was with the help of uh, Vladimir Valevich, and I'm thankful to him for that. And I'm still waiting when some kind of uh, like reaction will will appear on the face of Mr. Kulik. I thought I was a bigger kind of uh, kind of. Uh, character here, but 
you know, you used to be in the risk management as well uh, back in 2012, but uh, to be more exact. So in any case, well, we, conti we continue this dialogue and our cooperation all together. We uh, follow with the professional developments of each other and see what's happening. Our bank, Sberbank, sort of put a lot on uh, investment in LLM, large language model. So there are about three countries who are active in working on this. US, China, and Russia. And uh, in Russia, it's Yandex and Sberbank. So, and it's good that in one country, there are two different kind of models, two different kind of actors that are working with the same language. You know, recently I was uh, in Egypt where there is a bit of a problem with chat GPT and LLM, which is not uh, able to uh, produce results in Arabic and uh, sort of if you sort of like compare what's happening with Arabic uh, Twitter and with Arabic chat GPT, there are certain issues. So as I said, in Russia, there are two different uh, big companies that do a lot of investment and uh, both financial and intellectually. And we see that Sparebank, GigaChat, in comparison, in comparison with uh, in language model, uh, it can be compared with Chat GPT three, and uh, we're still sort of behind about Chat GPT Turbo. But uh, with Chat GPT three and a half, actually, we are on the same par. So to answer your question, will this architecture be a strong and powerful AI? To give a short answer, I don't know. And I still don't know because certain things we still need sort of like defined. What is a f what is an intellect? What is a free will? And uh, all of that will take some time to decide, define, and sort of like to be on the same page. We do not know the answer to this question. Now, when you look at the LLMs, I mean, they, they do have a normal kind of conversation with a person. But when you ask them to count how many apples are on the page, they can't really give you an answer. The LLM, large language model, is a completely humanitarian, uh, humanities kind of focused uh, kind of model. It cannot give you cannot solve different mathematical problems, 2 plus 2, yeah, because it has a bit of a fantasy to it, and we still don't know what to do with it. We try to find solutions, and uh, but objectively speaking, all of the LLM models do have that kind of issue. So. It's, it's a bit too early to say what will be the strong and powerful uh, AI. But back in November 2022, ChatGPT came out. And it was a big revolution that occurred. But I think the a bigger, strongest architecture that will take us to another level, that would be sort of like an orchestrated kind of structure and if we compare it with our human brain, we've got different parts responsible for different sort of issues. So the part that is uh, responsible for drawing has a bit of an issue to, uh, to do mathematical computations. So, so what we need to see is it will take some time for the things to be on the same page. And, but yeah, you're right. So the second thing it's coming out from what you just shared. What is actually the architecture? So it's certain objects that are connected in the same uh, in the same way. And I mean, if you look at take monkeys, I mean, they they, they can count. 
and yeah, I mean, humans are somewhere close to monkeys, maybe, but the change in the structure allow, that allowed for the conscience to come into existence. And that kind of change, the internal change that happened, the change in the system allowed for something to happen and it was turned on in a way. And how, what do you think? I mean, how far this kind of leap, how far are we from it? And or will it be coming gradually? I mean, it's becoming more and more sophisticated. Uh, so it is a bit of a it is a bit of a leap and every year you could say that it mul it's multiplied at least by by two that that AI itself AI is developing is developing and rapidly so it's multiplied by two it's multiplied by three so if it is a kind of a, like a leap so will it happen when there's going to be a conscience a living conscience or li not living but artificial conscience you know when someone so, someone someone was talking about aida saying that it gives uh uh, Aida, meaning artificial intelligence doctor assistance that it uh, that already gives diagnosis uh, to patients. Yeah, of course, if you, you look at the mythology, I mean, they, it had a bit of a different meaning there, but I mean, that's what it says in the modern uh, vocabulary. So this kind of leap, do, does it, does it, is it stopped by the lack of the, um, by the lack of um, conscience? All right, so the loop itself is not limited. All right, we'll go back to that topic, probably in a bit of time. I'd like to call on Denis Sushko, who is uh, with the VTB Bank, and uh, he's dealing with some of the, with some of the applied kind of science of the on the subject Denise so w if we talk about the free will what what do you think I mean for you who who's applied scientist uh, who uses applied science I mean w how would you define it or how, how would you be able to talk about it in about free will uh, and AI Vladimir, for those of us who use applied science, I mean, we all know the ingredients that consist that LLMs consist, and there are three of them: the architecture of this uh, of 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 the net uh, that is similar to DNA, the data set, and the data of uh, random numbers. And according to my uh, sort of opinion. I mean, it's sort of chat GPT that works. Of course, the neural networks, they do learn. And all of this uh, generative uh, artificial intellect, they are developing. So you want to say that the free will is, is, a, is a generator of random numbers. Yes, that's what I think. Personally, I like the following definition of free will. So, as applied scientist, I mean, as I see different kind of people uh, find solutions uh, to the same problem in different ways. And uh, the definition of free will itself is close to me is the following. That f freedom to think. When a person is thinking, he's digging, he's researching, and he's not necessarily motivated by career, by money, but he's motivated. He's got an internal urge to work on this. When I look at my colleagues, they're passionate in their thinking, uh, in the in the way some of our scientists like Mordashvili are defined, they are possessed to sort of research. And if you look at Tuber GPT, ChatGPT uh, collected a huge data set that 
all of them were uh, were contributing to it. And a lot of sort of like uh, critics uh, say that there was not a lot of progress, but there is a, a bit of uh, certain things that they were negative about Israel. Did not really uh, develop that much. So, without certain free will, being overwhelmed with this uh, huge data, uh, with neural network, it's not just becoming some kind of a uh, genius, good, good, good cop, good genius, or bad cop, bad genius. But what is actually lacking, and uh, is exactly that free will or the generative uh, random numbers. <laughs> In what you just said, there are quite a lot of different uh, complex issues. Uh, generator of random numbers. I mean, for example, I mean, second evolution that is uh, of putting things, leveling things down of the regress, the, the outburst of the, in the brain, the insight, and, and now you're talking about uh, Simpson. And I'm, I'm a bit uh, taken back, uh, but, but would you be able to talk about, I mean, this random generator, uh, random generator of numbers, how will you get good genius instead of a bad one? Of course, we need that a different kind of approach that Alexander uh, was talking about. We need to uh, sort of really look into that. Having collected this data set does not necessarily allow us um, does not allow us to have some certain um, huge leaps, but it allows us to give maybe a more diversified. Uh, kind of answers when you when you give uh, when you pose a question to the chat GPT. So, in other words, uh, those uh, data it's been um, it's been processed and the answers are being given. And certain things are sort of uh, certain answers. They they are sort of average just because of the huge influx of the data itself so yeah so if you're talking about homer simpson and um it, it, it gives me a bit of a scare i mean uh, if you're making these com comparisons and uh, talking what we can do to actually um, to improve things, let's go to someone else, to Vasily Kucherov, who's a professor uh, of cognitive science, and perhaps he can um, sort of give his two cents from the scientific perspective. What do you think about this strange kind of discussion? Thank you, first of all, for inviting me. I'm sort of. I'm looking from a different, very much, very different perspective. I'm looking from the brain perspective. Um, what have we reached for neurobiologists? It's a very interesting pro process. How how it is in comparison with the human uh, brain itself, and. What's scary is that it's actually very much alike, and that any kind of object is becoming humanized. And uh, I mean, the humans, uh, humans, we we we're making things uh, like if we take an animal and it starts talking, we're sort of humanizing it. So, what if we take an object? And now, if we are looking about ChatGPT, who works like an eight-year-old uh, boy, and and he starts talking. So, for us as scientists, does the system of that kind have any kind of characteristics of a brain? First of all, there's no any kind of. Uh, so technically, this network would reach the brain level. 
But you know, the uh, whole idea is that it's not quite possible. But that's a certain topic for further discussion. That's what the scientists doubt that make it nearly impossible. There are two approaches, really. The first one says that linguistic models show the language structure. The second one say that it really reveals the brain structure. Uh, Elena Fedorenko, one of the scientists, had a lot of ex uh, law, didn't pass her exams in Samara and became a professor in MIT. And she conducted a wonderful research a year ago. They tried to predict the brain activity via the language models. And the leading models allowed to predict it in 100%. That means that there is uh, there are some emergent processes that do copy the brain activities. But we may see that the system works the other way. And we can see now that there is a huge difference in uh, the data processing. And if we are talking about the amounts, uh, uh, it is working with the, within one thousand of words, while our brain allows us to process 15 words at a time. But still, there are some differences that do disappear rapidly that say that this path might take longer. And this very idea in universities is studied all over the world. For us, it's nearly impossible to get rid of the idea that our speech is something we operate with. We spend something like a quarter of a day within our inner dialogue. Usually we use three billion of speech operations. But if we are talking about the speech and consciousness, these are various things. I guess that if you have a pet or a dog, you understand that you know a dog might have this consciousness, and that's what biologists agree upon. So what is brain and what, is, what does the study show us? That for example, when you do have hemorrhages, you may lose the ability to speak. So what does the neurobiologist say when he loses this ability to speech? That is Jill Taylor. So he lost this ability to speak for several weeks. Usually you wake up in the morning, the first thing you see is your brain. The sun is shining. Imagine that you don't hear this inner voice saying, here is the sun. You just feel the sun and the way it shines. There is something above speech that makes us unique. That is the feeling of this brightness and of the sun. Neurobiologists would say, if we would try to summarize it, that we have no possibility to say that in 2030 this network would not be equal to our brain. But there are a lot of questions that make it nearly impossible. Okay, I see. So if we are talking about the very freedom, you know, I belong to the neurobiologists who say that freedom does not exist at all. So there is no difference between the network created by Sberbank and the human brain. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, this question of the free will is not the one we are discussing. So you support Dennis, who says that we can use this operator of random numbers. We can simply exclude it from the equation. You see, if someone here is keen on neurobiology, please read Robert Sapolsky or watch his lectures. That is a marvelous lecturer from Stanford. He wrote a book, and I asked my wife to bring it here, to bring it to me, with the understanding that we are not free. That's quite a topic that is being discussed in neurobiology. Uh, actually, you'll bring, you will see a lot of studies on the brain. So before you make a decision, there are some processes existing. So, for example, the decision whether to come or not here is the decision that could have been predicted by your brain activity. 
there exists a certain illusion that we do make decisions, but technically they are formed like a waterfall. The issue is about the logical algorithms that all our decisions had the reasons. That's meaning that this determination shows that we couldn't have made the other choice. Considering this point of view, we were all destined to come here. We should have had the other brain so that we would not, we wouldn't have come here. So you need other reasons to have the other behavior. Okay, imagine that the bank collapsed. So there have been a lot of reasons for the worst decisions to be made. Go back to the past. If you do not change anything, there will be the same decisions made. So if we go back to the past, to the moment where you've made a decision to come here, well, you know, your brain would face the same choice. So you would come here again. So considering this very ideology, we would say that there exists that illusion that we might make the other decision or might have made the other decision. What we have is the imitation of freedom. We make decisions by chance. But are we speaking about real freedom, about real will? Not at all. You know, I sat... So you know, the quantum physics starts itching in me. So that is the possibility rate. So the very idea you are discussing is something that has meant that after the big bang, everything was determined. But the physics that describes just a bit the universe is about involvement, about fundamental involvement and about universal laws. That's quite a good question. And you know, the very discussion about possible and determined things is a very important one. I would say that this possibility is not something that defines really your choice. And it doesn't define the whole algorithm of a decision being made. Like, for example, whether to fire the deputy director for the bank. So what are we discussing now? Wait a minute. OK, so that is an important thing, like a free, like a decision made by chance is not a free decision, a free made decision. So if we are talking about neurobiologists. We would say that something made by chance is not something chosen by you. Where are you? I'm not plunging into this topic. It's very provocative and I love it. But today, please don't laugh at me, but a lot of neurobiologists are quite skeptical about this free will, free choice. Actually, that changes a lot. The responsibility, the liability notion. I hope I have managed to provoke you just a little bit. Thank you. Okay, you see there are people leaving and they they had known that they would leave. Yeah, they had this decision like who should be fired and then, you know, they were free to go. Yes, Vasily is right, so we should think of neurobiology and to have this explanation why I was meant to make a mistake, for example, and why that was an ideal thing. Yes, and like a conclusion that, you know, would be a very good thing to be used by the quality assessment and for the investigations within the company. You know, this very question of probability, of things destined to be and predefined to be, I would love to address the question to Andre. He is also a professor, and he is presenting the uh, Moscow Institute for Physics and Technology. He is working 
in fundamental mathematics studies. And as far as we know, maths is the language of God. So now we are entering these godlike things. So what would you say? That was quite a good introduction. You know, there are a lot of probability issues in maths, but they are not pretty much about real life. So what we have been discussing, that is just an attempt to simulate a certain model, to approximate it. So when we are saying that something has happened by chance or just because I had a free choice made, that is something that requires a definition and the mathematical definition, something that could be made, like we have the probability approach that was formed within years and centuries, like what you can be call what can be called like probability or something that has happened by chance, but there is a certain number of notions that do define it. In 1933, there happened an important event. Great mathematician Kolmogorov was courageous enough to say that a certain set of definitions can be something defining the probability. So I would try to explain that, like here is something about 100 people and I am calling for someone and I do just someone by chance. Considering mathematics, that means that each person here gets a certain number, which is a probable number. And there is a certain level of probability that I would call this person to come here so that there would be a certain number of them and the sum of these numbers should equal one. You know, that is kind of an agreement that cannot be applied to the reality. And moreover, I would agree with the very definition that there is no freedom of will existing. If we are talking about the quantum level, some of the processes can be considered like simply probable but that is the very mathematical approach that comes and that is based on the Kolmogorov's paradigm. So here is something about 100 people and that is 1% that I would call each of you to speak up. That's like the possibility being counted. And then we can say, what if we start counting? Maybe the ideal thing is the other one. That's like the dice being thrown, which can have six facets, and the possibility is just one sixth. And you know, I think that philosophers could define the topic that we're discussing now much better, but there are philosophers who have opposite views. The one is saying everything, everything and anything can be changed in the last five minutes. Like you have been a saint and five minutes before the death, you become a sinner. You can say that two multiplied two is four and that is basic math. But you know, math is perfect and that is why it can be applied. But philosophers might say, I don't want to be okay with that. It's not four, it does not equal four. Is that my will? It's not. Surely that is a philosophical question and math is just a possibility to have a beautiful simulation that can approximate the world. If we would listen to the four of you, we will see the uh, the following. You are saying, we do have the tools for the so-called freedom of will. And you say, evolutionary, 
We will definitely have it. Dennis says, yes, and we are waiting for Mr. Simpson to add some new knowledge. And the uh, last of you says, but actually, he possesses zero freedom. Thus meaning that there are no limits so that we would not come to that point. So you all, you four, like if we listen to you attentively, you are saying that there exist a sufficient number of tools, sufficient number of competence, set of competence, and there is no theoretical limit. That's the way you sound. That's the way you explain that. Well, it might happen that I explain it like that. Well, of course, I'm like going to extreme a bit, but if you leave this room with such an understanding, you would be mistaken. Technically, what should be the philosopher's point of view? Where does the world go? You know, it could have been better if we had some genius, be it good or be it a villain. But if we are talking about, like, you know, Homer Simpson paradigm, that is something different. So what's your opinion? If we are talking about tools, if we are talking about fundamental scientific knowledge, can how can you apply this freedom of will? Does it exist really, or are we simplifying the world? Are we making it too simple by fragmenting it? So we are having the PhD in philosophy of St. Petersburg State University, Alexander Stikatsky. You know, if we would try to be quite brief, and discuss it as a philosopher, this problem of the freedom of will is the most relevant. And there exist opposite points of view, starting from the classical cognitive approaches from Denita, from Searle, and up to the non-fiction realism, which was described by Brian Greene, the very problem can be defined as follows. There is a certain quantum of freedom, the very unique smallest object of the reality that could have been far from the good or bad issue that could have been existing before the Big Bang, what could it have been? I suppose that the truth belongs to those who consider that our understanding, our notion of freedom and the freedom of will is the result of the illusion or the fact that our knowledge, our knowledge is not sufficient yet. But that's what colleagues have noted already. I suppose that that is Leibniz who was right, that it is that, you know, overestimating the role of freedom is the human mistake. But we are also overestimating the regularity. We are overestimating the very pillars, the very basis. So we do not understand what's really happening. Take a look. If we imagine that the illusion of freedom can be destroyed by the act of studying, by knowledge, we should understand two things. Firstly, the very decision to learn is the act by itself. We could mm, have simply leave everything as it was. Sometimes we don't make this decision to learn, to read. We let the world simply happen. That is why we do not get into the paradox. 
when we thought that we would raise the hand, but something inside, something inside the brain mechanism, that was something that defined this decision. So if we make the decision to study, to learn, then we accept all the consequences. Sometimes learning, sometimes studying is something punishable. So that is not about billiards where you can weigh the table, where you can weigh the balls. But the other thing is when we are discussing the quantum reality, where we're discussing the ion selection, where the act of learning changes and demands the object that is being studied. So that is the other object, not the one that we had studied studying. That is the paradox of the observer. When you destroy the very model of the object being observed, and that is also the same when we are talking about the subject. So there we allow the subject to stay with its small secret, with its inner idea fix, or we use the what we can call the observer's X-ray, and that's why we are that's the way we are killing the second generation of the Schrodinger's cat. Because the first one have been about the superposition and they are being destroyed even earlier. It means that here we are working with what we call with the universal evolution arrow that appeared after the Big Bang. So it's about the very solution that is the very idea of studying, the very notion of knowledge. So that is what we call the index of the random numbers. That is about fluctuations. That is about the particles. All these are good models for freedom, which are about our impossibility to predict. And the very fact that they become an integral part of the cognitive tools and methods, something that is about AI studies brings us to the new frontier that shows that these random numbers index is something where we can cross the simple calculations and get to the full consciousness that exists just within this fluctuating regime where it absorbs the particles. So as far as we do study the reality surrounding us, we do add some things that were meant to happen. That is quite a paradox that getting some sense from the text is more complicated than creating it. So if there is a certain sense, we can get it from the zodiacs, from the stars, from anything. It's impossible for us to understand that anything in the world could have happened by chance. So, you know, the brick falling from the roof can be meaningful for a human. So like this, we are using any reason, any basis to create senses, to create ideas. For our consciousness, it's very scary to live in the world where everything is happening by chance, that is not being based on anything so material is about chances. That means that the chance can be fixed and it lasts quite long. That's how we define what is the free will, which is also based on something that is studied quite long. But that is something free. 
that's about freedom. So that is why the life in the universe is something which is easy to be existing. You know, when we are talking about coffee grains, you know, uh, and coming back to applicable signs, we can also address to Branislav, who is specialist in Chinese. He's a writer. And I think if we are talking about coffee grains, we can ask him what he thinks about it as far as ancient traditions are being operated by a certain set, by a certain number of the objects. Like people have been predicting future where coffee, where stars, and they have seen some ideas in it. They have seen future in it. What does the Chinese philosophy tell us about it, about the AI and the freedom of will? Where does it appear? How does it appear? How do people understand it? It's very interesting that in Chinese tradition, there was no philosophy in a way. It was the, the Westerners who came, up, who came up with the idea of the Chinese philosophy. But in Chinese tradition, there was no concept of freedom. Nobody very much cared about this particular concept. People lived as they did. But of course, the, the reality in itself was determined. A hair would not fall without his will, uh, as the old Chinese um, would, uh, would call the Hebrew text. But at the same time, everyone was dreaming. What about the, the Book of Change? But, uh, you know, as Confucius and others um, would say, you know, they would not use the Book of Change to uh, to predict the future. It's a bit of a code or technology that teaches a person who wants to create his own sort of like network, the neural network, and that will be like the ultimate network for this kind of people. From, from the 64 binary uh, pairs, uh, and it's identical to the um, to the D uh, DNA, and the basic uh, actions are determined by that. What Chinese tradition says, there's no there's no brain that decides uh, on behalf of the whole system. No, it's the whole body. Every part of you, every hair, is equally important as the brain itself. And to, and to be honest, I mean, uh, I mean it, it can be proven by the Chinese medicine, serious results can be observed. The, the whole system and this kind of concept and approach works actually. But the actual concept of will is connected to kidneys. Will is connected to kidneys. Kidney is the heavenly particle, and that's sort of like a sort of a big bang of some kind. And the will is a very kind of thin um, material that is connected and works with the concept of time. And it understands that the exact very moment at the right now has very particular characteristic to itself. And if you know how it's all constructed, you can predict every other action and how it will materialize itself in another in another set of time. And back back in the ancient China, nobody cared that much about the past, the future, and the present. All of that existed at the same time. And all of that is focused, uh, connected to the way you perceive a reality. And all of it also depends uh, from your moral sort of code, from your physical training. So the freedom of choice and uh, it also consists from the freedom from choice. 
So, and the freedom from choice, uh, you know, not a lot of people actually possess it. So try not to choose. Try to switch off your brain, uh, you know, switch off your brain from listening to me, from the gobbledygook that I'm telling you all about. Thank you, Branislav. You know, preparing for this uh, discussion, I was reading something last week. Uh, I was reading some uh, sort of mass media about the AI, Scarlett Johansson uh, sued the developers of ChatGPT. Um, her premises was uh, for the for suing them was that certain images of Scarlett Johansson were uh, were developed by ChatGPT. You know, I kind of laughed to myself. You know, does she really think that AI uh, created their Im her images of her and they're really alive there? Like, like, you know. But listening to you all speakers, I mean, the fears that exist and that exist in Scarlett Johansson are, are, are real in a way, you know, the, the, the intellect of Homer Simpson and uh, the fears of Scarlett Johansson, Johansson are, are similar. So first, it's predetermined that this AI would reach a certain level of intellect and development that a particular develop uh, a particular creative part of the development would s would start to exist and um, and of course it will not be a sort of freedom of ch free free will or freedom of choice but it it will that creative bit in AI will start functioning. And I think our world in this kind of uh, way, um, and you know, listen to all of you on this uh, discussion, my my sort of thinking will will change a bit because uh, the fears of Scarlett Johansson are close to me. Listening to you all, the question that I have, you know, like if you could give a brief answer. Same question goes to all of you. So, having reached this particular level of uh, conscience, what would be your advice? What we need to do? It is inevitable that AI would live among us, no matter whether it will have free will, whether whatever will be happening, what kind of elements will be there. But what would be your advice, uh, Dennis? You you're the one to start. So I think, so whenever AI would start existing in that kind of human form in a way, it will be able to reproduce some of our functions of human beings. But I believe in the freedom, in the freedom that drives uh, us humans. Freedom to do certain things because you believe in them. And AI, of course, would be helpful to us humans. So I still think it will still be an assistant. It will not be something that will replace a human. And so from my side as a neurobiologist, a lot of the fears that are connected to AI, this is the projection of our fears. We, we, we are sort of expecting certain evil and threats from the humans, and we expect the same from this AI, from a new threat. So if we have good kind of expectations, you know, that's, uh, you know, then we'll, we'll be thinking, you know, shall I turn on the chat GPT or not? Uh, so I think if we are able to be better, AI would be better as well. So it all depends on us, on who we are and, uh, at, at its core. Thank you. Uh, several conclusions I made. Uh, first, uh, you know, my life is boring. That's my first kind of conclusion. I got to think about it a bit. Second, going back to the AI. It's a very interesting philosophical discussion that my colleagues have participated in. But, 
you know, but I'm, I'm more into things practical. I'll continue to what Vasily was talking about. Uh, you know, like uh, putting our own perspective and on AI, you know, how about we stop doing that? We'll start teaching AI. If you, if you have kids, you know, you teach them, you know, and, but if your kids are only in their phone, in their computer, you know, there will be not that much of the good stuff that will come out of it. So we got to, we got to invest our time into our kids, into education. And that's what we got to do with AI as well. We got to train it well with an ethical code and both uh, VTB and Sparebank, you know, there are about 100 companies that signed this kind of agreement and uh, in about 100 countries, we signed all of this agreement about where the AI is going and what kind of rules we uh, got to be applied to it. Andre, you know, just one second. But if AI has free will, will it go into something forbidden a sector and then it will learn something evil uh, you know but I think I think it should go into that evil sort of sector and section and should learn because without you know knowing the, the bad you cannot knowing the, the good you know I uh, just to briefly three ideas for me first I never stated that AI is inevitable. Maybe, but but you know, like you know, the, the opinion that AI is inevitable. I don't believe in that. I don't agree with that. And second, it's a, it's a matter of working with different kind of chores. Yeah, yeah. You know, I've got down some of your sort of like ideas that you have, but anyway. So, science is developing in the following way, that every scientific discovery can be used for good or for bad. And that's a very important thesis that I'd like to repeat. Absolutely, AI could create certain problems, but it could also bring a lot of good. And the third point, you know, like, no, you never know where that bullet will meet you. Yeah, you, 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 you know, you, you think you got to be afraid of AI, but maybe you should be afraid of some, um, you know, bat spider kind of thing. You know, so you never know where the humanity will cease to exist. Will that be because of AI? Will that be because of something else? Or maybe everything, everything will work out and we'll all be good. Just to put it briefly, our chance... Uh, is the following you know any ai no matter how perfect it is could be a, could be attributed to our own capability and back in history it it has repeated um uh, you know like demons mermaids and other magical creatures you know they see they they left the story world and then they entered another realm you know but so what i'm saying is like you know we got to we got to teach ai and whenever it comes out and live its own life you know what will happen depends on us so whoever will be able to teach it correctly will gain more of it all right vladislav this is an old chinese an ancient man that i am so a lady comes to a doctor can you look at my kid? He's sick. Uh, doctor, please uh, undress and. Uh, dear doctor, I'm sorry. I don't need to undress. I'm. 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 I'm uh, it's my kid who's sick. Please, you know, your 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 kid has a problem. We need to make a new one. So what I'm saying is, we just need to make a new kid. If there is any problem with AI, the current one, don't worry, we'll create a new AI. So, I think what happened was, in the last 45 minutes, we we we, we made a great leap, having come to certain positive um, uh, results and ideas. Thank you all uh, for your participation. We sort of sh we have shaken you 